This is a very long and chatty video. Its purpose is to give an insight into the life of a junior doctor, whether you're a student in university working towards a career in medicine or anyone outside of the healthcare profession who just might be interested in what the life of a new doctor is like. I hope you enjoy. Hi, my name is Nasser and I am a doctor living and working in London. I just graduated from medical school a little bit ago and have officially completed my first week working as a doctor here in the United Kingdom. It's been a hell of a ride so far, a real baptism by fire, and I wanted to make a video talking about what my experience has been like in this first week, how I felt, the structure of my days, and what it's like to finally be practicing medicine as a doctor after nine years of higher education. Every year here in the UK, there is a single day when all of the new doctors leave medical school behind and hit the front lines for the very first time. This day is called Black Wednesday and is often reported by the media as being a day where you shouldn't go into hospital because all of the doctors are brand new and they claim that there are increased negative patient outcomes and all sort of other headline grabbing stuff that actually isn't true. In these first few days, all of the more senior doctors on the wards, the senior house officers, the registrars, the consultants and other healthcare staff in the MDT, like pharmacists, nurses, HCAs, they all know just how junior these new members of the team are and they actively provide lots of extra care and support and oversight over them. This actually leads to more teaching, senior involvement and care than most other random days in the year. But anyways, I digress. My journey into my first week as a doctor actually starts two days before Black Wednesday on the 1st of August, 2022. Before you start your first real day as an F1 doctor or a foundation year one doctor, you're usually given about two days of departmental shadowing to learn the ins and outs of patient flow, how to use the electronic patient record, where to find the material that you might need throughout the day, things like items for taking blood, where the crash trolley is in case someone has an arrest, etc. I showed up to my first day of shadowing and the ward was understaffed with only two doctors present instead of the usual four. When I introduced myself to the consultant, who is the most senior doctor present on the ward, he said, oh great, we have three doctors today, not two. To which I responded, actually, I'm just an F1 and I'm shadowing today. I start work on August 3rd. And then he looked at me and he said, nope, you're working today. To which I said, okay, cool. And we got started. Now the structure of a normal nine to five day in ward-based medicine looks something like this. You start the day at around 8.45 in the morning, familiarizing yourself with the new patients on the ward and also preparing the notes for all the patients that you're going to be seeing on the ward round. Then at around nine, you start the ward round. This is an exercise where anywhere from two to four doctors go around the ward seeing all the patients on their list. You observe them, talk to them, examine them and see how they're doing today. You also check up on their management plan from the days before to make sure that it's being followed. You can check up on their blood results to see if anything has come back or something like their infective markers have gone up. You check the drug charts to make sure their medications are all correct and make any adjustments if necessary. And you do this by going around to see the patients one by one. Now, as the most junior doctor on the team, the foundation year one doctor, my job is to run behind the consultant or registrar with the computer on wheels and type manically to keep up with everything that they are saying, writing it down in the electronic records. Now, this is what's called documenting. In medicine, you document everything that the patient has said to you, all the observations you've made, the advice that you've given to the patient, examination findings, literally everything. So that's my job. We'll walk up to the patient's bedside and I'll immediately start typing things down. So for example, I might type something like, patient seen sitting out in their chair, talkative, feeling well, they're alert with a GCS of 15 and comfortable at rest. Catheter is in situ, draining clear urine, etc., etc. And then one of the more senior doctors will examine the patient and relay their findings back to me. So for example, they might listen to the heart and say, heart sounds normal. So I'll type down heart sounds one plus two plus zero. They'll listen to the patient's chest and maybe say minor creps on the left base. Have a feel of the patient's abdomen and tell me that it's soft non-tender, calf soft, pitting edema noted up to the knee, something like that. Now the trouble here is that as soon as consultants finish with the patient, they're usually running off to go see the next one, which leaves me trying to document everything that I just saw and heard as quickly as I can and as accurately as I can whilst chasing them with the computer to catch up and hear what they have to say about the next patient. Now trying to do all of this whilst also navigating the electronic patient record, which involves many different clicks to save your current document, pull up the next patient, make a new entry, title it appropriate you know, record all of the important information from the previous days or previous entries in the system. There's a lot to do in those like 30 seconds that it takes to walk to the next patient. Now on my first day, this exercise felt like an absolute blur. I honestly barely had time to think about what I was doing. I was typing at the limit of my not so fast typing speed, forgetting where some of the buttons are on the computer system and asking the consultant to repeat some of their examination findings because I couldn't remember what was said or I was typing something else in the meantime. I remember that the ward round passed so quickly. I remember looking at the clock at some point and it was 5 to 12 or 10 to 12 and I thought it was 10 a.m. in my head. And you know, even though I have seen
seen ward rounds before as a medical student many, many, many times. I've followed along on the ward round and I've seen all of this happen. Being the actual one taking the notes and doing everything yourself is just an entirely different ball game. And you really feel that level of responsibility that is attached to you. Something that I really enjoyed on my first day was being able to introduce myself to different members of staff and to patients as Nasser, one of the F1 doctors. It was such a good feeling and it honestly warmed my heart every single time that I said it. Finally working as a doctor and doing the things that I've been working towards for so long, nine years of higher education is one of the best feelings in the world. Now the ward round itself, it usually lasts till 12 or 1 p.m., but it can last up to 2 p.m. or even later, depending on how many patients you have or what specialty you're in. And then after the ward round, it's time for the MDT or the multidisciplinary team meeting. Now the ward MDT is a meeting where representatives from multiple different teams sit in on a single meeting discussing the patient's care holistically. So you'll have doctors like myself over there, you'll have physiotherapists, occupational therapists, nurses, sometimes pharmacists, HCAs, and other members of staff that are involved in the patient's care. And you go through each patient one by one and each team gives their input on to the patient from their perspective, from their relevant team. They'll usually give an update on how they've been on the previous shift, anything that's required for them to be able to go home in the future, anything that needs input from some of the other teams, etc. And a lot of the time in geriatrics or care of the elderly, these discussions will revolve around how we're able to discharge the patient. What package of care do they need when they leave the hospital? Are they going to a care home or to their personal residence? Are social services involved? And things like that. This meeting usually takes around an hour and it's a really good time for me as an F1 to do some of the work on the computer that I would otherwise have to do later on in the afternoon. For these meetings, it's really important that you know your patients well, because you'll be sitting at your computer and someone will announce, okay, bed 23, John Smith, which might be your patient. And then you'll have to give a quick update and summary to the whole team about what's been going on. So for example, I might say, yes, John Smith, he received his IV iron transfusion yesterday after a drop in his HB. He's feeling better today and we're aiming to discharge him tomorrow if PTOT are happy with his mobility. Then PTOT, the physiotherapy and occupational therapy team might chime in and say, yeah, we're happy with all the things the patient has done and they're ready to discharge from our perspective. Then the discharge team will say, okay, I'll call the care home and let them know that he's ready to leave the hospital. Then the pharmacist might chime in and say, hold on, the patient's TTAs, which are the drugs that the patient takes home with them, shows that they're being sent home on IV antibiotics. Should we switch that to oral? At which point I'll say, sorry, my mistake. I should have done that and switch it to oral. The MDT runs something like that. It's about an hour long. And after that, it's time for the jobs list. Now the jobs list is an accumulation of jobs that have arisen throughout the day. The vast majority of these jobs come from the ward round that we just did and talked about where each and every patient will have a plan for management for them. As so for example, for patient X, the plan might be to switch them from oral furosemide to IV, to sit them upright in the bed, start them on two liters of oxygen via nasal cannulae with target sats of 88 to 92%, and also to liaise with the renal team for advice regarding their kidney function, and also do bloods today. So from this long list, myself, the nurses, and other members of the healthcare team will look at it and do the jobs that are for them. So for me, as a doctor, this would involve prescribing the medication, the furosemide, taking the bloods, and also talking to the renal team for advice. And for every single patient that we saw on the ward round, which could be anything from 10 to 25 patients in surgery, they often have 40 patients, maybe even more. Each one of those patients will have their own set of jobs. And so in the afternoon, you literally get out a pen and paper and you write out this long to-do list for each and every single patient, all the jobs that are required for them, and you start tackling it one by one. Now this can take ages. There's usually a lot to do and all those jobs on the patient's list is gonna take some time. Some of the quick and easy things that you can do are prescribe your medications and fluids, but things like communicating with other specialties can be quite difficult and for a junior doctor like me, kind of intimidating. Now, at this point, I need to say that I'm very, very grateful to my senior doctors, the SHOs and the registrars and the consultants who I've been doing these ward rounds with. They've honestly been teaching me quite a lot, answering all of my questions and really taking the time to help me understand and help me learn all of the various systems and processes that are involved. All of my questions have been answered without judgment and have made me feel really welcome. I'm still getting the hang of everything and these small gestures of showing care for the juniors honestly goes a long, long way. Going back to communicating with other specialties, on my first day, one of the jobs on those patient to-do lists that I was talking about before was to liaise with the orthopedics team for advice regarding one of our patients. So how you do this in a hospital is called bleeping. If I want to talk to the orthopedics team, then I need to find a specific four digit number which will put me through to orthopedics. I'll pick up the telephone, input those four numbers, then input the four numbers of how they can reach me and put down the phone. On the other side, the orthopedics registrar will be carrying a little bleep and it'll suddenly start going beep, 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 beep at which point they'll look at it and they'll see the four digits of my number from where I'm calling from. Then they have to go to a telephone, pick it up, type in those four numbers, and they'll be able to communicate with me. So the other day when I bleeped the orthopedic reg to ask for advice about a specific patient, 
<laughs> I completely choked on the phone and asked like half of the questions that I needed to that didn't even make sense. The registrar on the other side got a little bit annoyed and probably rightfully so, so made a sassy comment and closed the phone. Now look, I probably deserved it. I could have been more prepared than I was, but I'm still learning how to do these bleeps and handovers over the phone and I just wasn't ready on my first day. Anyways, this isn't always the case. On my second day, I bleeped the palliative care team to ask about prescribing a morphine syringe driver because I didn't know how to do that. And while I was on the phone, they asked me what my grade was. I told them that I was an F1 doctor and they responded so cheerfully and happily saying, welcome to the trust. I hope you have a good first week. And they were extremely, extremely helpful. They walked me through how to prescribe anticipatory medications step by step, which was a great learning experience for me. And so bleeping different specialties can be quite simple or quite daunting, depending on who you call, when you call and what you're calling about. But anyways, I've rambled about bleeping for way too long. The afternoon consists of carrying out all of the jobs on your jobs list and can honestly consist of so many things depending on what you have going on. But you just need to sit down and crack on doing as much as possible before the end of your shift. At the end of your shift on a normal working day in ward-based medicine, this tends to be around 5 p.m. But often, as you may have heard, doctors end up staying much later than that to finish all the jobs on their list. Now, as you might know, and as you might expect, the hospital is a 24 hour service. So it doesn't just close at 5 p.m. And when the day team goes home, the on-call team needs to take a handover from them to be able to continue the care of the patients. So what this means is that before you leave your ward, someone should come to your ward to take on the handover of anything that needs to be done in the next couple of hours before the night team comes at 8 p.m. Sometimes you'll meet on your ward, other times there's a designated place where handovers occur, but regardless, you need to find out where this is and go find that person who's gonna take on the continued care of your patients whilst you're at home. Now, sometimes this handover list can be quite trivial, you know, just keep an eye on the bloods for patient X or follow up on the CT scan results for patient Y, but then other times you might have patients who aren't doing very well and are at risk of deteriorating. So you might want to keep that on that person's radar so that they can look out for it or be aware that this might happen. And then once you've done this handover, you're free to go home, be a super lazy and tired potato and pass out on the couch before doing it all again tomorrow. One more thing that I wanted to talk about is that on top of doing everything that we just talked about previously in the video, which is honestly quite a lot, every now and again, and more frequently than you might imagine, someone from the healthcare team will pop in their head to tell you something about one of your patients. For example, patient X's family want an update on their condition. So you add that to your jobs list. Someone will come in and say, who's the doctor looking after bed 12? If that's you, they might say, patient has a blood glucose of 12. What should I do? So then you need to go deal with that. Or maybe you're sitting at your desk and the phone rings, you pick it up and it's pharmacy asking about the discharge medications for one of your patients. It can be a whole variety of things. But the point that I'm trying to make is that all these constant things popping up left, right, and center really interrupt your sort of flow state. As soon as you sit down at your desk and think to yourself, okay, time to start working through this jobs list, you know, taking things off one by one, you'll get people coming and asking things of you and interrupting you from all angles and sides. And then by the time you're dealing with that new piece of information that's come in, you've forgotten where you were before, what you're doing, and you're out of the flow state or zone. So far, I've honestly found this quite tough. And I think that being organized in managing all of this new information that comes in left and right, is gonna be a really important skill for me moving forward. So after all of that, coming home after the first day, I was exhausted. I'm so lucky that I'm placed in a hospital, which is relatively close to my home, and I'm able to drive to and from work. I can't possibly imagine getting on a one to one and a half hour tube commute home after a busy working day like that. But honestly, I arrived home and I just felt so mentally and physically drained. I had no energy to sit at my desk and go through my emails and other life administrative or YouTube tasks. I barely had enough energy to make myself dinner and I just wanted to be in bed. At the same time, my head and my heart were just racing. I felt like I couldn't calm down and I was just in this state of go, 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 go. And I really hope that this tiredness is something that improves over time because I've got an entire life outside of medicine, which I really want to keep up, you know, playing sports, making these YouTube videos, being social and the rest of it. From what I've seen on hashtag med Twitter, it doesn't look like this is going to get any better, but I have high hopes. So now that you know what a shift for a normal working day looks like, let's talk about my second day of shadowing. The second day was quite similar to the first, but just a lot better. Just the fact that I had done the day once made the second one feel a lot less like a blur. And I kind of felt like I knew what I was doing a bit more. I was still running around frantically with the computer, chasing the consultant, trying to know everything down and not being able to remember all of the details about the patients I was seeing, but it was less of a blur. And on this day, I couldn't help but think back to the days when I was a medical student and I would go on these ward rounds and they just seem to take forever 
ever, they would pass so, so slowly because you would just be sitting there watching everyone else do their job, really not being able to take part as much as you would like to. You're mostly just observing and you're not really doing anything on these ward rounds as a medical student. But when you're the one in front of the computer and you're the one actually doing the work, the day just completely flies by. Everything passes so, so fast. And one of the things that I always knew I would love about medicine and that I'm really happy has been confirmed to me now that I've started working is just the fact that I'm not sitting at a desk doing office type work. The fact that you're on your feet and you're going all around the hospital throughout the day, you're moving from one position to the next is such a breath of fresh air. But speaking of medical school and being a medical student, I'm soon gonna have my own medical students shadowing me on the wards. How exciting. I swear I'm gonna be the best F1 doctor at shadow. I'm gonna take really good care of them. I'm gonna tell them which patients are interesting so they should go take a history from them. I'm gonna help them learn to take bloods, examine patients and all the rest of it. I honestly can't wait to help have medical students with me and try to give them the experience that I wish that I would have had a lot of the time on clinical placement. But regarding the rest of day two, it was honestly very similar to day one, really chaotic, really fast paced, everything happening so quickly, the next level up, doing a little bit more, having a bit more responsibility, and that takes us to day three. Now day three, I actually had allocated to me as a self-development day. So in your rota, which is your work schedule as a doctor, you have a couple of different shifts that you can do. So there's a normal working day, which is from nine to five, which is what we've been discussing in the previous part of the video. You have twilight shifts, which are from 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. You have long days or on calls, which are from eight in the morning till 8.30 at night. And then you have night shifts, which are from eight at night until nine in the morning. But then you also get self-development days. And these are days which you have off where you're expected to complete online learning, work on research projects and things like that. So for me, the 3rd of August or Black Wednesday was scheduled in my rota to be a self-development day. But this is the NHS and the ward that I'm attached to was understaffed. I was asked to come into work and so I did. Now this was officially my first day of actually working as an F1 doctor. The first day where we're not shadowing anymore and now you are expected to take on the full roles and responsibilities of an F1 doctor. The good news for me is I'd basically just done two days of practically working and taking on that responsibility responsibility because the ward was understaffed and I was acting as a third doctor. And so really this third day largely felt like days one and two. And looking back, I'm honestly really happy that I had these three days of full experience working as a doctor because the next set of shifts that I did were weekend on call shifts. So quick little camera change. I had to go do something the other day and I'm gonna continue filming now. I've just come off of a shift and it's about 7 p.m. So I'm pretty tired, bear with me. Okay, so after those first three normal working days, it was time for me to do my first ever weekend on-call shift. So my very first on-call shift was split into two. Nine to five was a normal working day on the same ward that I had been talking about before. And then five to eight was evening on-call cover. So what this means is that at 5 p.m. I have to go to the ward where I'm going to be on call, take a handover from them. Now, when I tell you that at the beginning of this shift, my heart was literally beating out of my chest. Like genuinely, I was so scared. I was scared of being alone. I was scared of being unsupported. And I was scared of not being able to deal with medical emergencies by myself. And doing all of these things out of hours would just be really tough for me as one of my first ever shifts as an F1 doctor. After taking the handover, the consultant who was there very, very kindly gave me their personal phone number and said, you know, if you need anything, if you're worried about anyone, just call me. And that made me feel honestly, a lot more comfortable than I was before. The fact that someone would be there on the other end of the phone if I needed to double check anything was very, very comforting. So some examples of things that were handed over to me by the day team were things like, can you please check on the blood results for someone at about 7 p.m.? Can you see if this person's x-ray has been done? If you see X, Y, and Z, then do X, Y, and Z. Or that this patient is really unwell and they might deteriorate in the later hours to so keep an eye on them. Then they gave me the bleep, which is this little device that goes beep, 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 as you know, and it's used when nurses are worried about their patients, they can call me. Or if other people are worried about their patients that are related to oncology, they can call me as well. Not sure if I mentioned or not, but I'm on call for the oncology wards, whereas during the normal day, I'm working in geriatrics. At this point, I was so nervous. I felt like I had a ton of responsibility and I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to go through with all of this. But again, my team were lovely. The consultant stayed until 6 p.m. and then the registrar stayed with me until 7 p.m. They helped me with some of the jobs and helped answer a lot of questions that I had and I loved it. Then at 7 p.m. the registrar went home and I was literally all alone, just sitting there finishing odd jobs, hoping that the bleep wouldn't ring. And luckily it didn't. At about 7.50 p.m. I went to the handover and I handed over my patients to the night team for anyone that they needed to keep an eye on and I went home. Little did I know how much easier the three hours of being on call in the evening were in comparison to the next two days I was gonna have where I would be on call from eight in the morning until eight at night. But anyways, leaving the hospital, I almost couldn't believe it. I was so happy. I was so proud. 
I was just stunned that I had finished my first on-call shift as a doctor, my first 12-hour shift, and everything was okay. Driving home, I was so tired, I barely had time to just heat some food, eat it, watch something on the TV, shower, and sleep. Which brings us on to on-call day two. So this was the first day where I was going in at 8 a.m. and leaving at 8 p.m. I had to take handover from the night team at 8 in the morning, and they told me about any of the patients that were relevant for me in oncology, and then I went up to the ward to meet my consultant. Now this day was so incredibly hectic. It was supposed to be just me and the consultant because the registrar was away, but thankfully they hired another F1, which is actually one of my friends that I met at induction last week. And so it was two F1s and the consultant. And thank God that other F1 was there because Without her, honestly, I don't know what I would have done. It's just so much more comforting when you can run your plans and your decisions by someone else. You can ask them to double check something that you've prescribed, even if it's as simple as a one liter bag of sodium chloride. You know, you just want them to double check it, to look at it so that you have that comfort and that peace of mind that two people have seen the same thing and we both agree. When you're alone and doing those things, the responsibility and the pressure just feels huge, at least for me, and having that one other person there made all the difference. Throughout the day, it felt like that bleep just would not stop ringing. And luckily on the other end of the phone, there weren't any emergencies or anything super, super urgent. But when the bleep rings, you don't know what you're gonna get. It could be an emergency. It could be someone just saying, hey, like, can you come check on blah, 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 blah. Or could you prescribe this medication for whoever? And so every time you hear the ring, you're like, Okay, here we go. The day was really hectic, but again, between myself and the F1, we managed to do all of the jobs just fine. And at about 5 p.m., the F1 went home, the consultant went home, and it was just me by myself. At this point, again, my heart was racing. So by about 6.30 p.m., I had finished all of my jobs, and luckily the bleep did not ring until 8 p.m., and there was pretty much nothing for me to do, just review the bloods, you know, make sure everyone's okay, put out bloods for tomorrow, follow up any x-rays and stuff that we were waiting on, and that was it. I went hand over at 8 p.m., and then went home. This day was the scariest of them all. During the day, it was fine because the registrar was here. Woo, finally. So we did a really quick ward round with the consultant and the registrar, did a bunch of jobs and everything that we needed to do. And then at about 4 p.m., registrar was like, peace, I'm going home. Again, out of the kindness of his heart, the registrar left me his phone number and said, please call me if you need anything. Thank you. So at this point, I had about four hours ahead of me of being alone and I was holding the bleep. Now those four hours were so, so hectic for me. Basically, some of the bloods that needed to be taken that day were not taken by the inpatient phlebotomy team. And so I had to retake them myself. Now taking bloods isn't a particularly difficult task. It just takes a lot of time. And when you have a lot of other things to be doing on the computer, you know, in the time that it takes you to take bloods, you could have clicked on the computer like a hundred times and done a lot of other things. I remember being a medical student and, you know, sometimes going to take bloods, I would be sweating, sweating so much that it would like come through my scrubs because I'd be nervous, I'd be anxious. If I didn't get the blood the first time, you know, I wouldn't want to poke the patient again and possibly hurt them. And, you know, now as a doctor, I feel like if the bloods need to get done, they need to get done. And you know, most of the time everything goes fine first time, but if you happen to miss or you don't get them, you can adjust, you can try again, you stay calm. If you really can't get it from that site, you pull out, you know, start again from another place in the arm or in the hand, wherever you can find a good vein. And it just feels good to kind of have overcome that transition from being worried about taking bloods, you know, not feeling confident to now just, you know, staying calm, making sure they get done and just being okay with it. So throughout this evening, I got called a couple of times by nurses who were worried about the observations that they had seen on pain patients, you know, things like high heart rate or low blood pressure or both at the same time. And this was kind of the first time where I really felt like a doctor. I took all the information from the nurses, asked more pertinent questions, went to review the patient myself, did like a full history exam and just sat there and thought about like, okay, what is going on? How can I fix this? What's the correct management here? You know, it felt really good kind of taking all those things that I had learned throughout medical school and applying them to real life and thinking them through. And then later on seeing that the things that I did had a favorable result. So I remember after I went to see the first patient and I reviewed them, you know, came up with a plan, changed their uh, pain relief from oral to IV, gave them some fluids, uh, had a look at their drug chart and made some adjustments there. And then about an hour later, you know, rechecked the observations, rechecked everything. And I saw that the patient was stable. And I was literally by myself in the doctor's office. And when I saw that, I was just like, we did it. I did it. I did the intervention. The patient felt better. Hurrah. And the truth is that I was kind of forced into this uncomfortable situation. I was the only doctor on the ward. The patient was unwell and I had to go see them. But being able to kind of read the situation, do the right thing, and then see the patient get better just felt so amazing. And I'm sure I'm going to get more opportunities to do these kind of things in the future. And, you know, 
the more I do them, the more I'm gonna feel like an actual doctor. One last funny thing I wanna say about this shift is that at about 7.45 before I wanted to go to handover, I was waiting for some blood results to come back for a patient from one that I had bled earlier. I'm scrolling through the results, you know, checking, is there anything that needs actioning now? Is there anything that I need to hand over to the night team about this patient before I go? And I was scrolling through the results, looking at all the different parameters, and I see a potassium of 23. Now, if you don't know, the higher end of the range of normal for potassium is 5.5. 23 means your patient is dead like no one no one can have a potassium of 23 so when i saw that my jaw dropped i literally could not believe my eyes i felt like i was about to have a heart attack and then i realized that i misread that it wasn't the potassium that was 23 but it was the urea also not so good but a urea of 23 is okay, like it's manageable, we can do that. A potassium of 23 is, it means your patient is dead. So I guess that's an example of how, you know, at the end of the day, after three nights on call, I, I misread that number. And, you know, I guess it just comes from being tired, you know, just having done a lot of things in the day. And it was a lot, thankfully, all fine. I remember waking up the morning of that third day on call and just feeling so, so drained. And I don't think it's so much uh, being physically drained, you know, from being on your feet all day, walking or running around in the hospital. I think it's because my brain was just running at 110% for the entire 12 hour shift. And you're constantly in this sort of full focus mode and you forget to eat because you're so busy. You don't even realize that you're hungry and you're just thinking, thinking, thinking and doing, doing, doing the whole time. And I remember when I went to handover on the last day of my three days of on-call shifts, I remember feeling like it was actually actually daytime instead of 8 p.m. I felt like it was my morning and I was just about to start my day. And this feeling of the days kind of blurring together because you're spending most of your awake time in the hospital working was kind of strange. But I survived. I did it. I went through my first string of on-call shifts and they were weekend on-calls and it went great. I'm so, so grateful to those seniors who stayed behind with me even when they could have gone home, you know, who gave me their personal phone numbers and told me to call them if I needed it. They've just been so supportive and I'm really, really thankful for that. I honestly don't know what I would have done if my seniors were just like, all right, cool, I'm going home, good luck. After that string of three on calls, I had a normal working day. And so out of all the events I've described in today's video, I worked seven out of eight days and I was just beyond exhausted, I was dead. It's been a bit of a crazy introduction to the life of a working doctor, but I'm honestly really enjoying it so far. And I'm sure that a lot of these things that I've talked about today are gonna improve over time. And I think what I'm most looking forward to over time is just feeling confident, feeling like I've seen this scenario before, I've dealt with a patient like this before, and I know how to manage it. And having that experience, having that repetition of actions brings comfort and it brings confidence. And that's what I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing how I feel on future rotations and in the coming weeks and months, you know, on different specialties, I'm sure things are gonna be a lot more intense on my next two rotations uh, on surgery. But anyways, I've still got so many weeks ahead of me of this rotation, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you've made it this far into this very long video, I just wanna say thank you so much for watching. Please do leave a like on it if you enjoyed it. And if you're new here, click the subscribe button and check out the tons of other videos that I have on the channel. Thank you so much for your time and I will see you in the next one. Peace.